Would you turn with me, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, and I'm just going to kind of tack on to this weekend. I don't believe I'll get through all this material tonight, uh, but if you would uh, allow me, I believe that next Wednesday night we'll continue on this vein, this thought, this, uh, this lesson that I want to teach tonight, because I want to talk to us about momentum, just simply momentum and, and the value of momentum, and when God uh, allows us to step into a season of harvest that we just received, then now is the time to step back and kind of rest and say, well, there, that, that is what we worked for. Maybe this, the last three and a half years where we've had a, a fine focus on multicultural ministry. That's, that isn't the end all. That's the beginning. That's the start. That's just the, the, the beaker being tipped up and starting to pour out. It's not the finished product. It's the beginning. So we're going to talk about a little bit about momentum tonight and the enemy hates momentum. And, and I just, man, I want to just feel the Holy Ghost the entire way through this lesson. If you'll allow us just to let that flow back and forth from vessel to vessel, I believe that God wants to talk to us tonight. First Samuel chapter 17, familiar portion of scripture. 1 Samuel 17, 33, and Saul said to David, thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Saul was looking at the situation through his historical context of what he had not been able to accomplish, but what he hadn't realized is that God had opened a new season, a new opportunity, a new plan, a new focus. And so David was stepping in while Saul was slowly being moved off the scene because of his inability, like we see in this moment, to believe God for more. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. I went after him, smote him, delivered him out of its mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, smote him, and slew him. David had victories in his history that he brought into his present not just to reminisce and not just to catalog for history's sake and not just to kind of create a diary entry so he could talk about it in the future, but rather so it could catapult him into the plan that God had for him. He said, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And, and he said, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. He said, not only the lion, but also a bear. He said, Goliath isn't going to be any different than what I've already experienced. He said, the victory that I've had in my past, I'm going to bring it into my present so it will move us into the future. Does that make sense? That's momentum. That's taking what God has already done and bringing it forward, allowing it to compel us and push us and encourage us and condition us for what God has in store in the future. He said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Could we just pray for a moment? And, and I wish someone would just get a, get a hold of a little victory that you, you celebrated on the weekend and bring it right into the middle of Wednesday night for a minute. Would you do that together with me? Would you just kind of take whatever circumstance you may be facing right now, a Goliath? that's on the horizon, that's hollering your way, would you just kind of let the victory of your past and what God's already doing, bring it, bring it right into the middle of what, what is happening in your life right now. Jesus, we give you great praise. Lord, your name is a strong and mighty tower that the righteous run in and are safe. God, we've got power in your name. And I pray, Father, the enemy, he's persistent. He understands the position that we are in right now. He understands the momentum that we are, we are walking into. And I pray, Father, that you would allow that momentum to bring us into your purpose, your plan, that your will would be accomplished. Let this be the beginning of something powerful, of something brand new. God, we make declaration of what you're about to do. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. God, we're doing our part to reach into every nature, every, God, every nation, every, every creature, God, every person, every people group, God, every language, I pray. No barriers, no restrictions, no hindrances, God. We're not trying to divide ourselves from anything because you have a plan for everybody. You've got a plan for every person, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Father, we align ourselves with your will tonight. God, we invite you into this room. Talk to us, God. Challenge us. Speak to us. Encourage us. God, compel us, I pray. 
In your great name, we ask, would someone just clap hands to the Lord for a moment? And now just connect your praise to that hand clap for a minute. Say yes, amen. Someone say amen. Amen. You may be seated this evening. How many of you remember reading the Guinness Book of World Records maybe when you were a little younger? You know, when they first came out, I remember they were a small, thick digest. And the pages were narrow and black and white print with little, uh, not very fancy photographs on the inside. But I can still remember different points in, in the Guinness Book of World's Record that, that would just kind of stick in your mind. I think the, the one that is most notable to me is the longest fingernails in the world. That just, there's just something that, that was destroyed in my mind. When I saw those fingernails all curled around that guy's hands, it's like somebody do that guy a favor and cut those off. But, um, but if you've ever been around when there is a world record that's attempting to be beat or someone that's trying to make their place in the Guinness Book of World Record, you'll find that there are always officials there for verification and authentic, un, authentication. Um, I remember there's one time that, that and I, I still have regrets over this. I, I wish that I had taken part. I, I think it was Ann Kinney uh, called or wrote an email and, and said that they were, they were doing the, the world's largest simultaneous cutting of the cheese at Superstore, and they needed someone to officiate. And I declined that. I still don't know what I was thinking. I have no idea because do you know how much street cred you would get at youth camps if you ever said, I was there for the largest cutting of the cheese on record? <laughs> or anywhere for that matter. I'll let that settle. I turned down the spotlight for that event. But verification and authentication, people look to the officiant and they say, you know, is this that record-breaking moment? Is this what we were looking for? Is this what we were hoping to authenticate? Is this, is this what we were going for, full tilt? I, I remember reading just a few weeks ago, the, great, the longest lobster roll. Did you see that? Anyone see that? The longest lobster roll? The world record for the longest lobster roll was, it was, no, they, they were saying theirs is, is the real deal because it was one continuous piece of bread, one long roll, and they had a, a little uh, trolley set up or a little conveyor belt set up that, that brought the dough through this uh, bake, bakery, I don't know, through a, an oven, that's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> and people were lined up alongside, and, and it was one continuous roll that this long, the longest, the world's longest lobster rolls, I, I thought that was quite uh, fantastic. I thought, how, now who was saying the bread's done? I was like, can you leave that in for another minute? I want my section to be well done. Or, you know, I like mine a little more doughy. Let that, let that roll in. Anyhow, authentication, trying to authenticate, trying to verify uh, that that was, in fact, a world record. But, you know, I, I would, I'd like to... Uh, our, our uh, lead usher at the back said on Sunday morning, he said, I believe that that is a, a record for our church for the most number of people that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in a 24-hour period of time. And I, I think I would have to agree with Brent that that was a record for our church family. So if you're looking for authentication, we've got it from our head usher, and, and you'll hear it from the pulpit that that was a fantastic record-breaking weekend for us. I, I, I just want to celebrate that for a minute. Is that okay? So yeah, if you're looking for someone just to kind of say, this is that, that, the, that, that God is promising us, if that is the beginning, then we can, we can stand with confidence tonight and to declare it. We can say, this is that, that Joel was speaking about, like Peter did 2,000 years ago. He, he stood in the day of Pentecost and he authenticated what had happened on the day of Pentecost. This is the Holy Ghost being poured out. Can I tell you that this is that, everything that God has talked to us about, we have 
have come to make a declaration in this service tonight that we are walking into a brand new season. We are stepping over a brand new threshold. We are opening a brand new door. We don't want to miss the moment that God has created, that God has prepared, that God has offered us. We as a church want to step in. Full harvest is ready and waiting for the church if we're ready to receive it. Everyone say continue. The question, if we are willing to declare this is that, then we have got to answer the question, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to continue? Uh, and, and I'll just tell you right now, don't get your easy chair out. Don't get the lazy boy set up because God is preparing us for a harvest and we have got to reap while there's opportunity. While the field is white unto harvest, church, we are going to reach. We are going to pull. We're going to teach. We're going to love. We're going to do everything that we can as the church to do what God has called us to do. Would you take a minute and just celebrate what God is doing for just a moment? We're talking about momentum, but before we ever get to talking about carrying on what God has done, we've got to celebrate what God has done. We've got to authenticate what God has done. We've got to declare it. Something miraculous happened in this place. Something miraculous happened in the multicultural chapel on Saturday night. Something miraculous moved in this room, and God just poured out blessing that we have never seen before. Would someone just believe that for a moment? I'm, I'm just going to stretch your faith for a minute tonight. We're just going to celebrate it for a minute. I just need about five people to stand up. As a matter of fact, if 25 people stood up and said, God, we're in agreement with where you're going in the Holy Ghost. God, we're in agreement with what you're doing in our church, in our community. We're in agreement with how you're moving, how you're ministering. God, we're in agreement with the miraculous. We're in agreement for Holy Ghost. We're in agreement for revival. If you're looking for a church for it to happen in, in the last days God you found us we're right here 71 Downing Street pour it out pour it out pour it out Woo. come on we can't let it become a distant memory we can't just let it become something in our past we've got to bring it into the present like David said it was a bear before and it was a lion in the past but Goliath, you might rear your ugly head, but we've already got victory that we can point back to. I'm telling you, Sunday and Saturday was a victory for us to point back to so that when we go through it to the next season, God has a revival ready for us. We can receive that revival that God has ready for us. We can walk into it with confidence because God has already done it and he will do it again. I'm not limiting God to 25 on a weekend. I'll just tell you right now. We're talking about 50. We're talking about 100 people receiving the Holy Ghost in a single service. We're talking about everybody that came into the room being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're talking about conviction and repentance moving in our service until the baptismal, it's just got to be changed because it's filled up with people that have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about a balcony that's full. We're mowing the grass so people can park out into the 40 acres. We're talking about what God is able to do. Ton, full bus full bus on bus ministry full sunday school classes full youth class we're talking about a full church building we're talking about revival move it forward church move it forward move it forward so we got to just kind of stand on that and there, there's power in our declaration if we just don't talk about it, if it just kind of becomes a distant memory, then we, we lose something that God has begun. There's some power. There's a power. That's why David talked about his past victory, because he knew it would encourage him in the, in the present. He knew that it would change the heart of Saul. He knew that it would open a door that was shut at the moment. But because of what God had already done, he knew that God could do more. So what God has already done, we just got to stand on it and say, God, don't stop here. We're trusting you for more. We're trusting you for open doors that have never been opened before. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. We're trusting you, God, to open avenues that we have never walked down before. We're talking about roads that maybe we've never even stepped on before. But God's already got people waiting for us to knock on a door, for us to open up and, and just kind of talk to them about what God would like to do in their life. God is open opening a door. In 
Thank God for it. Momentum. In the natural, it's a, a law that deals with the physical properties of matter. I was never a, a great student, but I always enjoyed physics. Physics was, physics was uh, one class because in, in my, to my mental capacity, my mechanic, uh, my mechanical bent that I have in my brain, it makes sense to me. It's logical. I can see properties for what they're talking about. Chemistry failed it the first time. Can't see it. I'm a little bit like Thomas, I guess. I've got to see it to believe it. I can't understand that, uh, you know, I, did, I will say that the second year in chemistry, I, I passed it, did well. Isn't that pride right there? <laughs> Felt like I did tell you that. Physics did well, enjoyed it. But I found that in physics, you know, it was properties that you could see. And, and has anyone ever seen Newton's cradle? That's kind of what this is based on right here. If you could see uh, the screen a little better, there's strings that are attached to each one of these, uh, these letters. And, and uh, it's Newton's cradle. It's those balls that are all connected by string. And you pull one side up and you let it go. And, and uh, a series of five or six balls. And then on the other end, it, it just kind of swings the other ball up. And that ball comes down. And the energy is transferred through those those balls until the end and it goes back up, you can, you can grab two or three and, and, and the properties maintain because of the law of momentum, that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an equal or opposing force. And, and if you were to look up the equation for momentum, it would be mass by velocity. And often we'll look at a dump truck rolling down the road and, and uh, you know, the McCoy's rolling along and, and um, there's a big dump truck rolling, and we think, well, that has a lot of momentum. Well, mass by velocity, well, maybe it's not moving that fast. Let me, let me tell you that you can be small, but if you're moving fast enough, you've got a lot of momentum. Like a rifle bullet, a shotgun slug. There's power when you connect those two things and you multiply it together. But it just talks to us about momentum. Momentum is mass by velocity. And if you, if you kind of just bring that over into the Holy Ghost, can I tell you that God is doing something powerful and there is something that's moving in our midst. The Holy Ghost and faith, when it gets connected and you multiply those factors together, God does this work of moving the church forward in a powerful, momentous way. There's some momentum that comes alongside of a church that's moving forward. There's power and momentum. And, and um, have you ever had to bump start a car? I like electric start, personally. But if you've ever had to bump start a car, you know, I remember having to bump start motorcycles. They were standard, so you could kind of run alongside of them and jump on the seat at the same time and release the clutch and the motor would turn over blah, 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 and you'd drive off. Do you know what I'm talking about, bump start? A okay. So it's like trying to get the momentum up enough to do the work, to get that vehicle started and... and um, it takes a great deal of momentum. You got to drop the clutch and the, the vehicle lurches while the engine slows the vehicle almost to a halt and then the motor turns over. I think we bump started the big bus one time at the parking lot. <laughs> Why didn't we video that? I just remembered that right now. Um, but perhaps maybe the, the most memorable story about bump starting a car uh, is about. Um, when I was in my first year of Bible college, hi, Brother Mills. <laughs> this isn't about me, so um, Brother Mills was uh, in, in charge of keeping us all in line, and, and he did a phenomenal job. Would you give Brother Mills a hand? <clears throat> Quite possibly the most patient man on the planet. Um, but we were in first year of Bible college. We weren't allowed to, to date in the first semester. But by the time January rolled around, we could enjoy four and a half hours of date time. My friend Dave wanted to go on a date, but he didn't have a car. And um, that was the, the, the norm for most of the people at the dorm at that time. We, we didn't have vehicles. We all walked back and forth. And, and uh, with the exception of the Noel brothers, the Noel brothers had a, a 1978 Toyota Corolla. It didn't look quite as good as this one, but it did look like that one. It was red. Um, it wasn't a hot rod, and it wasn't a collector's item. It just happened to still be alive enough for Mark and Mike to use it while they were in school. 
And uh, their use of this car came with a few strings attached. Like in order to get it going, you needed to push it. So um, that's not really a problem when you're a guy at the dorm because if you want to get to school, then you just offer a ride to a couple guys and they push the car and the car gets going, they hop in. They, a quick push is better than a long, cold walk. Now, that's probably physics somewhere, but I don't know what the formula is for it. So, you know, the, this car that didn't have, I think the alternator was gone, and I actually called uh, Mark this afternoon to verify this story because I remembered this, and, and I didn't want to get it wrong, and I wanted to get it right, and didn't want to lie in the pulpit. And he verified that this was, in fact, the case. So our friend Dave, he wanted to go on a date. And... Um, so he negotiated with the Noel brothers, dangerous territory, and uh, they came up with a, a plan, and, and um, Dave didn't want to take the whole dorm with him on his date. <laughs> so I remember the Noel brothers said, well, you're going to have to play it smart. You're going to have to either park on a hill or you're going to have to have somebody around to, to give you a push. So, <clears throat> or you have the other option. Don't turn the car off. Keep the car going. And so Dave heads out to Harvey to pick up his date. And uh, only to meet the RSMP as he's nearing the village. Who were doing their due diligence on patrol. And they flip on the lights and they pull him over. So of course when they approach the car, they tell him, please turn the vehicle off. So he complies, and then they proceed with the routine license, registration, insurance. And that becomes a bit of a comedy of errors because Dave's foaming around the vehicle. And if my memory serves me correct, the only thing that he can produce is his license. He doesn't have the insurance. He doesn't have the registration. He's got a story about borrowing it from two guys that he lives in a dorm with in Fredericton. And the story gets a little soft. So the RCMP call into the station and they verify that the vehicle isn't stolen it is owned but it's not owned by any guy named mark and it's not owned by any guy named mike <laughs> but it is owned by a phoebe noel and so dave's able to put the dots together for me he said well phoebe is mark and mike's mother and they you know the registration must be in her name and they're using it while they're at school and so finally the story kind of pans out and the rcmp just tell them to keep the speed down and and you know drive safe and they turn to walk away and dave says like well just a minute. I'm going to need a push to get the car going. And so that's how good the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are. They uh, give him a push, and Dave said, I'll never forget looking in the mirror, and here is the police officer that, that's pulled me over pushing to get the car going. He said... <laughs> He said, I may have let it go a little longer than normal before I let the clutch out. We still have a, a good time pulling that story out. So the key is, is if, uh, Dave, you should never have shut the vehicle off. And I think that the, the evening went fairly smooth after that. Um, but can I just tell you that when you get something moving forward, the last thing that you want to do is turn it off. The last thing you want to do is kind of shut it down and, and wait for a few weeks or wait for a few months or, or kind of stop things until the calendar says, uh, you know, there, there's a great event that's happening. The key is just to, to sustain that momentum that you've got to keep going forward, to keep moving on into the place that God has for you. And, and, I, and I just, I, I want to tell you, church, you've done so well. It's been amazing the last few years to see people get on and push this vision forward and we've got the right people and we got the bus we, well not Lazarus it's not here now but Lazarus Lazarus finally died I'll just tell you he's not still around but the bus I'm talking about this the church We've got people on board that want to be on board. We've got people moving vision forward that want to move the vision forward. And if you're not involved, I'm encouraging you. Just find a place to push with us. Find a, find a place. Get on, get on the bus. We'll, we're still trying to figure out the right seat for everybody, but I think we're getting there. We're going in the right direction. We've got the, the ship moving in the right direction. People are on board, moving forward. And now isn't the time for us to kind of kick back and stop what God has begun. When God has opened this season, then that's a 
very moment that we need to say, hey, this is what we've been praying about. This is what we've been talking about. This is what we've been believing God for. Now isn't the time to hold back. Now isn't the time to stop up. Now is the time to push like we've never pushed before, to encourage, to cheer one another on to good works, to kind of say, God, if you've really opened this season of revival, if you've really opened this season of opportunity, then we're not going to miss it. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to invite people that maybe we've never invited before. We're going to do the a work in the altar that we've never done before. We're going to pray like we've never prayed before. Why? Because this is a season of opportunity and we're going to push this vision forward that God has created for us. Momentum is the key to sustaining a victorious life. And, and David represented that. He, he showed us that. He, he, he allowed us the opportunity to to understand that what had happened in his past didn't just have to stay in the past. He could bring it to the present and bring victory along with it. And that is a powerful opportunity that God is given to us. So we are in this critical place of opportunity. Consistent, persistent attention must be given to maintain momentum. You know, I, I, I've learned, and Pastor is a tremendous teacher and and we've gone through resources and attended conferences and read business books and, and talked about vision and talked about team ministry and talked about all this. And, and when you come back to it, you can see it through scripture. You can see it with Moses. You can see it with Jesus and his disciples. You can see it in the New Testament church. It's not just individuals, but it's people that work together and move the vision forward together. And much of ministry is administration. It's not just the person in the pulpit. It's not just a, a special speaker. It's actually a team that works together and watches God do something miraculous, and we celebrate that together. I, I, I don't want to embarrass them at all, but Martin and Wendy, I was just chatting with them on the, the way in, but they invited, this isn't embarrassing at all, this is worth celebrating. They were in Superstore, from what I understand, and invited a Nigerian lady to church on Sunday night. And God filled her with the Holy Ghost. That's amazing. That's miraculous. And if that's the season that God has us in, how many more people are waiting in the aisles of Superstore to be invited to church so God could fill them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And some people would say, well, she's going back to Nigeria. Exactly. She's going back to Nigeria with the Holy Ghost. She's going back to see what God could do through her in her nation. Heaven only knows what God has in store. The little the young lady that was with us from, from Brazil went home, P7 clubs. She's had over 100 students attending just because of, of some experiences that she had at CCC. Brought it back with her. You don't believe that God could take an individual and turn some nation upside down? He did it in the New Testament. What happens is if we just continue to walk into this vision that God has, move with the momentum that God has given us. I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to be a stronghold. I'm not going to kind of arch my back and push against what God is doing. I'm going to flow with it. Get in the river and watch where God takes us. There's waters to swim in. We can't keep our footing. If we go to this place that God has in store for us, he wants us to launch out into the deep place that he has. He's created for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Each victory gain gives us a greater Victory. I've got five points that I'll leave you with tonight. This is point number one. Each victory gained gives us greater faith for the next battle. That's momentum. John 5 verses 3 and 4 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God tells us that victory is ours. God tells us that that victory is waiting for us to step into. That victory is waiting for us to receive. That, that if we are of him, if we've received him, if, if we're keeping his commandments, then God said there's a promise waiting for, for you to, to receive. There's a promise waiting for you to step into. There's, a, there's this victory waiting for you. But you just got to kind of walk into it, receive it, just believe it. God wants to do that, bring you victory. So every victory gained gives us greater faith for the next battle. That's what David was leaning on. 
in that, in that conversation with Saul. He said, look, I, I, I got to tell you, I know I'm small. I'm just a young fella. I haven't got a lot of strength. I don't have any armor. I don't have a lot to offer. If you just look at me by what you see, there isn't anything there. But let me tell you about what God has already done. Let me tell you about a lion. Let me tell you about a bear. Let me tell you about some victories that I've already received. And there was so much confidence. David had so much confidence in God and what God was able to do through him that Saul couldn't resist saying, but you know what? Go. Let God go with you. Let God use you. Let God do the work that you, that, that you believe that God could do. And, and he couldn't resist that faith that was in David. And so we've just got to kind of take that faith from this past weekend and say, I believe that God wants to perform the miraculous. I believe that God wants to fill us with his spirit. Victory. Every victory gain give us greater faith for the next battle. I don't believe it's just 25. I don't believe it's just uh, seven being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is more. Take that victory and walk forward with it. Someone say, I'm going to. Number two, you should always go into battle with momentum from your previous victories. First Samuel 30, verse 6, and David was greatly distressed. This is a, a story later on in life. He said, for the people spake of stoning him because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But the scripture says this, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. What did David do? He reached back into those past battles and he realized that there was victory waiting for him in spite of how everybody's perception was of him, in spite of this challenging season that he was walking into. He encouraged himself in the Lord. We could let that settle in our spirit for a minute. Can I just tell someone tonight, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. You don't need anyone to prop you up. You don't need anyone to say the right thing. You don't have to have somebody kind of be, be alongside you, pushing you forward. Delight yourself in the Lord. God is for you. Who can be against you? God's got a plan for your life. God wants to use you. God has purpose attached to everything that you do. If you just kind of delight yourself in the Lord, move forward in the plan that God has for you. You can go into battle with this previous victory, it can look like it's the worst situation, the worst circumstance, but God, God will allow you to pull that momentum into your situation and move into victory. That's what we believe. Understand that there is a place of momentum in spiritual life and spiritual warfare. You know, uh, Joshua understood momentum. Once he saw that his, his, uh, his enemies were in defeat, um, you know, you can read about it in Joshua chapter 10. It's hard if I do that tonight. Okay, now it came to pass when Adon Isaac, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it. He had done, and as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. That they feared greatly because it says that Gibeon was a great city. It was a great Try a great powerful city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai. So these people were beginning to do the math. They, they, they said, you know what, if, if Ai was defeated and Gibeah, they made peace with Israel, they kind of came to a peace agreement. If these nations are being defeated by Israel, then, then there is just, God is on their side. There is victory attached to these these uh, Israelites. And, and so we, we're greatly distressed, the scripture says. So they feared greatly. And uh, if you read in verse 4, it said, or, sorry, let me back up to verse 3. Wherefore, Adonisach, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, and, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me and help me, that we might smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, and they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up to us quickly and save us, and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Listen, fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. And Joshua therefore came before them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night, and the Lord discomfited them 
before Israel and slew them with the great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them all along the way that goeth up to Bethreth and smote them from Azra to Makeda. And it came to pass that as they fled before Israel, as they were going down to Bethron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still, thou upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down the whole day. Let me tell you that God worked with Israel. Joshua realized that. He said, you know what, let's move this vision. And, and what the enemy thought was going to defeat Israel, gathering all together, all God was doing was putting them in a, a, a confined place so he could bring Joshua great victory. He brought them. He kind of he lured them all into this one location. So now, instead of Joshua having to go out and fight four or five kings, now they're all in one location, one locale. And God is going to work with Joshua. But Joshua has this heart not to stop, not to quit, not to arrest what's happening. He said, hang on a minute, God. Let's keep the, let's, let's keep the momentum going in this victory. Let's keep the momentum going in this war. We don't want to stop just because it's getting dark out. Let's just kind of let the sun stand still and let the moon hold up in our place because we want to, to continue what God is doing. Can, can I tell you in the Holy Ghost that God is saying, CCC, why don't we just kind of hold on to this place that we're in and, and let's move forward into the victory that God has. Let's continue. If we got to say, God, just kind of, let's just hold up in this place of victory right now. Bring more souls. Bring more lost. Bring those that need to be found in, across our path. We'll do the work because we want to see the victory continue. We just got to have a little spirit of Joshua come in our life and say you know what God let's continue this victory don't stop let's keep the Holy Ghost being poured out let's keep the bap bap baptismal waters being stirred we don't want to stop what you've begun I don't want to stop so there's this understanding to move forward to keep moving forward don't stop the car don't don't resist what God is doing. You know, I was chatting with our team, and they, they, one of our team members said today that they said, now is the time for us to be so united, for us to work together. The enemy is going to try and bring division. The enemy is going to try and divide people. He's going to try and stir, stir up strife and stir up envy and all those things that, that can go along with our humanity. But now is not the time for that. Now is the time for us to unite together every person, loving every person, binding together, pulling together, pushing together. God wants, he can use a church like that if we just agree together. Number three, a proper understanding of momentum acknowledges its importance. Back to David, he knew how to get momentum and he knew how to use it against the enemy. Psalm chapter 18, verse 37, David said, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn against them until they were consumed. He said, I didn't stop. I didn't halt. I didn't quit. I just went after it until they were consumed. Church, I'm, I'm telling, telling you, I'm encouraging you tonight that there is a city waiting to receive what you have. And one person from the pulpit can't reach everybody. It's going to take, it's just like, I just see streams going out from our church into every area of our city. And God using you to be a light in the midst of darkness. God using you to be a voice in the midst of confusion. God using you to bring peace when people are troubled. God wants to use you exactly where you are. And so God wants us, like David came from home, that place where he had received victory, to the battlefront. When we leave this place, God is sending us to battlefronts all across our city so that we can compel people to receive, encourage them to receive what we have received. And God has it for them. Outpouring. Someone say momentum. David continued in that chapter. He said, I have wounded them until they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. 
For thou hast girded me with strength into the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried and there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. And, the, and then he just kind of ends it off like this. He said, and then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. God wants to give us complete and absolute victory. The enemy can be defeated and God can be exalted when we get determined hearts and determined minds and we start moving forward in the momentum. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again until they were consumed. So don't turn back. Push Press. Move into the place that God has for us. Number four, Ryan, you can come back to the music. Once the Lord gives you momentum, you must use it to your advantage. Don't stop after a slight victory. Continue until the enemy is routed and you have totally won. As fine as the dust before the wind, David, like Joshua before him, understood the importance of momentum. Continuing. Someone say continue. Continue. Don't stop after victory, but use that victory to go into the next battle. Finally, five, the period following victory is not the time to put your feet up. There are Goliaths to face after you face your lion and your bear. God, God has allowed us this victory, not so that we can just talk about it in the future, but rather so that we can go with confidence to the greater challenge that lies before us. Someone say greater things. Someone say greater things are ahead. I mean, can you imagine when David came back from that battle? Sorry, camera per person. Let me move a little bit. When David came back from that battle with the lion, he must have been so ecstatic. Maybe there wasn't a great audience. Mom, dad. You're not going to believe what happened. It was tremendous. It was a lifetime experience. Probably for, for many people, they think, you'll never have that opportunity. You'll never, you'll never see that again. That is a miracle. You'll, that is probably the greatest thing that you'll ever accomplish. That God strengthened you the moment that he grabbed a hold of that lion and ripped it, tore apart to retrieve that lamb. They would say, that is a once-in-a-lifetime event. You'll never experience, that's what the naysayers would say, or those with limited faith would say, or those that haven't opened their eyes to what God has in store would say. You'll never see a weekend like that again. We may never see, that, that, is, that is a historical event, and yes, it is. That's why we celebrate it at the very beginning. But can I tell you that it's just like a lion event? It's just an event that happened because God wants us to move on into a Goliath event. That event happened because God's trying to stir something up in our spirit so that we'll have faith to believe when 100 people show up that need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They are going to receive it. God stirred something up in our spirit say, you know what? If he could do it for 25 people, if, he could, if we could have six baptized on a weekend, then, then, then what is 60 to God? What is, what is 100 more to God? What is, what is 1,000 people to God? It's nothing to God. God wants to open that door, and he's allowing us to experience that that weekend so we can move forward with momentum to say you know what God did it God did it that weekend we're, we're excited about it it wasn't just the marshals it was the team working together but people were believing that God was going to do the work and so we've just got to take that event and bring it into the here and now and say God I'm believing you for more I'm believing you're going to do it again I believe it's going to be greater I believe it's going to be better it's going to be stronger there's going to be more opportunity that God presents but don't shut down on those opportunities Open the door wide and say, God, do that work. Do it. Bring the victory from the past into the present so God can help us step into the future. In the last days, say it, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Someone say, I'm going to believe God for that. I do feel the Holy Ghost stirring something up. So I wonder, I'm, I'm finished few closing remarks, but I, I, I do want to take advantage of what God is doing in the spirit right now, because someone, you're, you're just kind of, you're, you're receiving that. You're saying, God, I'm going to believe that with Pastor Jack. I'm going to believe that with Pastor Woodward. I'm going to, I'm going to believe that. This is the beginning of a brand new season. I'm not trying to sell anything tonight. I'm making declaration. 
I'm declaring that this is a brand new season. This is a declaration. We are in a season of harvest. I ran into the guy that mows our, our field. He said, it's hay time. It's time to hay. It's like, amen, clean the field up. But it's more than that. It's a season of harvest for the church. It's time for us to reap the benefits of what God. There's some things that have grown up in our city. There's some people that are ready to be harvested. There are people that are hungry for what you have. And God is saying, church, if you'll just reach in with the sickle and pull it out, there is a harvest waiting for you to receive all around our city. The perimeter, the suburbs, the, God is doing something powerful. And, and we're just praying, God, let this be that that you promised us. We're declaring, open the door. Let the rain fall. Let the spirit come. Let the wind blow through the church in our city, we pray. Would you stand together with me? We're getting ready to close the service. But I wish that if you would just receive the word tonight, it's just a simple lesson, simple physics illustration. But if it's more than that to you, if you're willing to say, God, I, I'm believing. I, you, just, you, just, you just opened a, a brand new portal in the Holy Ghost to us in this past weekend. And I don't want to stop there. I want to move forward into the plan that you have for it. If you. If you just kind of got that in your spirit, if there's something that, that just kind of quickened when the word was released tonight, would you, would you leave your pew quickly? Would you come to the front? We're just going to pray together. I'm going to have us pray just like we do on Saturday night. And I wonder if you would come on purpose. Someone come with the Spirit of God on your lips. So you just kind of pray in the Holy Ghost while you're coming to say, God, I'm going to receive that word. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to prepare for what you have in store for us. God, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be a part. I'm going to, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do what you called me to do. and those of you that have the gift of the Holy Ghost I wish that you would just lift your voice thank you for being so receptive to the word tonight but I wish you just kind of lift your voice a chorus in the Holy Ghost I, I wish you just let your voice out let the Spirit of God speak let the Spirit of God flow God continue. They continued steadfastly. There's something about continuing. There's something about continuing with God, with what God has in store for us. There's something about continuing, continuing the, the vein that God has prepared for us. This is like that New Testament church. Come on, just continue, church. Just continue. The enemy understands how powerful this momentum is. He's going to try and block it. He's going to try and fight you. But now isn't the time to, to let him get, have a foothold. He's, he's going to be like Sam Ballot on the wall. He's going to be trying to pull people down. He's going he's gonna to challenge you to come down off the wall. He's going to distract. But, but now isn't the time to quit. Continue. Continue in that vein that God has us in. Lord, we're moving forward. We're pressing on. We're not going to come down off the wall. We're not going to stop fighting. We're going to, God will build with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other but we will continue we will not come down we're gonna build God we're gonna we're gonna grow we're gonna reach God we're gonna do what you called us to do time God time it's so limited we are at the end of time so Lord I pray show us harvest fields that are ready God souls that are hungry people that are waiting walk in the Holy Ghost. Let us walk in the Spirit. Come on, let Acts 2 happen, but don't stop there. Don't let it stop there. God, multiply. God, multiply. Multiply what you've begun, God. Multiply how you started. God, the seed that's in the soil.
Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Can someone just release that in the Holy Ghost right now? There's declaration. There's, there's prophetic utterance in this room right now. If you just kind of reach out in the Holy Ghost. I'm not just speaking about the gifts being ready to operate, but I'm talking about what God is speaking into your life, what God is speaking into your family, what God is speaking about your workplace, what, what God is speaking about your community, your neighborhood, people that God's connected you with. Your sphere of influence, people that God's allowed your path to cross. Someone just kind of make a declaration, Lord, I'm reaching them for the power of your great name. I'm reaching them. God, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to do everything I can. God, let it be our focus. Let it be our attention right now when you're in the season of pouring your spirit out. God, I can think of two, three, four, five people that I would love to see by my side on the church bench. I pray, God, that your spirit work. God, lead us, order us, give us the words to say. God, give us wisdom. God, quicken our tongue, quicken our mind. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I wonder if it's from the left all the way to the right, gentlemen with gentlemen, ladies with ladies. I wonder if you find someone to agree with right now. And I'd like it just to keep that chain, a continual chain, find someone. Everyone's got to reach out if you're going to be a part of what God is doing. Man, I, I, I think every youth camp we were ever a part of, this is how we ended it. Praying for one another, but this is more than just youth camp tonight. This is spiritual season. This is an opportunity that God has. He's opening. I'm just wondering if you would pray for your neighbor. Pray for that person that you've got a hold of. with them, agree with them, agree with them that God's going to use us, agree with them that God's going to open opportunity, agree with them that the Spirit is going to flow from vessel to vessel to vessel to vessel, God, from heart to heart, from life to life, God, prepare us to be a sanctuary, pure, holy, tried and true, Lord, with thanksgiving, we'll be a living sanctuary for you. God, prepare us. Prepare these temples. Prepare us, God, for what you want to do in this temple. God, prepare us for what you want to do in this church. God, condition our mind not to be limited and restrictive, but God, that we would let faith reach out to the impossible. God, that we would let faith reach out to see, God, what you have in store for us. God, you told Abraham impossibilities from the situation that he was in, but you had a plan. You had a plan for revival. You had a plan for, for great and mighty things. There's something breaking right now. Come on, just step into that for a moment. We've got time for this tonight. just pray that God would fill you afresh with the Holy Ghost the same way he's going to pour it out on some brand new soul some brand new heart, some brand new life no exclusions
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many will take what you've got to a world that needs it? How many want to do that? How many want to be a part of that? I think when David came before Saul, first he didn't understand who he was. Just reports, rumors floated his way about someone who was willing to fight Goliath. I'm sure that when David stood before him, Saul was, Saul was just shaking his head. What in the world? What a waste of my time. Until David spoke. And I think there was something that was lost and locked deep inside of Saul that resonated with what David said. This is what God did. And this is what God wants to do. And by the time David left, there was something that was resonating in Saul like a pitchfork that just tunes. There was something resonating inside of Saul that said, and he, he said, you can read it right there. He said, go and the Lord be with thee. I think Saul had as much confidence that God was going to use David in that moment as David was confident that God was going to use him. That's the kind of confidence I feel in this room tonight. And so I just kind of echo the words of Saul. Go, and the Lord be with you tonight. God wants to use you. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants to use you. Look, Taylor, God wants to use you. Look, Calhoun, God wants to use you. Tony, God wants to use you. Brother Nathan, God wants to use you. Brother Chris, God wants to use you. Brother Dave, God wants to use you. Brother Phillips, God wants to use you. Brother Marenzi, God wants to use you. Greg, God wants to use you. Brother Scott, God wants to use you. Some of us are in some of the most unlikely positions. We don't understand why God has us where we are right now. Can I tell you? David just left with, what was it, cheese and bread? What was he bringing to his brothers? I can't remember. Food. But by the time he got there, he, he was on a, a purposeless mission by his standards. Should be taking care of the sheep. But by the time he got there, he understood why God had him where he was. And God's got you right where he needs you. Go, and the Lord be with you. Go into that place that God's got you. Let your light shine. Speak the word. Let prophetic utterance happen. Let miracles occur. God only knows what's in store in the next week, in the next month. If we'll just let this momentum move us into the vision that God has for us. I'm in danger of preaching it all over again, and I still got four pages of notes. So you better go. God bless you tonight. In Jesus' name. I believe in you. I believe in God for the future. Someone say revival.